Who is Jesus? Our world has all kinds of opinions about the most famous person in human history. Some say he was a great moral teacher. Others say he was a prophet. Some view him as an advocate for social justice, while others consider him a revolutionary. As Christians, we have an answer. Jesus is Israel's Messiah, God in the flesh, the Savior of the world. But we too sometimes harbor unbiblical ideas about our Savior, viewing and presenting him in ways that don't do justice to the picture that we see in Scripture. In our interview today, I'm talking with Rebecca McLaughlin about common misconceptions about Jesus that people often have and why we dare not put our Savior in a box. Rebecca is a writer, a speaker, and the author of a number of books, including Confronting Jesus, Nine Encounters with the Hero of the Gospels from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me again on the Crossway podcast. It's my pleasure. So we're going to talk today about Jesus and the way that we think about him, the way that we understand him, sometimes misunderstand him. But I think before we jump into some of that, it, it's it's worth mentioning that we, we all know that Jesus is so inextricably tied to our culture here in the U.S. and probably in the West more generally. Jesus is just... Uh, integrated in so many deep ways. It's not uncommon for us in the U.S. to hear politicians and musicians and actors and the like citing Jesus, often maybe to support this or that cause or movement. And yet Jesus is really hard to put in a box. And that's something that you do really well in this new book. You help to to explain why it is that Jesus breaks our category so often. And I wanted to start off our conversation by reading something that you write in your new book that gets at this in a profound way. You write, Jesus in the Gospels doesn't fit our modern paradigms. His attacks on the rich and his protection of the poor make most left-wing leaders look like heartless fat cats, but his teachings about sexual sin make most conservatives look soft. Jesus talks more about love across differences and inclusion for the marginalized than the most tender-hearted liberal, and yet he issues terrifying warnings of God's judgment. He calls us not to judge lest we be judged, and yet he says that one day, he will judge us all. So those are strong and and seemingly paradoxical words, especially for the ways that we think about and talk about Jesus in our culture today. So first question, why do you think that we, Christians and non-Christians alike, tend to oversimplify Jesus' identity and his message? Mm. Gosh, I'm, I'm reading through Matthew's Gospel at the moment because our, our church is, is preaching through it and in our Bible study com- community group, we, we look at a different passage every week. And one of the things that's been freshly apparent to me in that process, not just of reading myself, but of, of discussing you know, with, with folks in our community group who actually come from all over the world, is quite how quick people are in the Gospels to try and act like they've figured Jesus out and and quite how resistant he is to that. It it seems in the Gospels, you can only actually see who Jesus is if you come basically on your knees. Um, If if you're standing up trying to analyze him or sort of own him in in that, that modern sense of catching him out or thinking that you can make him fit into an existing paradigm you already have, it's just not gonna work. And I think we experience some of that today, uh, as you mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago. It's easy for those of us who are raised in the West to think that Jesus is sort of all over our, our history. And, and in one sense, he is. Um, Jesus's teachings like the foundations of our, our best moral aspirations, whether it's love across racial difference or, or equality for people from uh, all sorts of different socioeconomic backgrounds or whether it's the equality of men and women or whether it's the fact that the rich and the strong and the powerful shouldn't be trampling on the poor and the weak and the marginalized but actually should be caring for them all of those find their first and and best foundation in the teachings of jesus mm. They're not self-evident truths, as, as many today, whether yeah. Christian or otherwise, w- would think. So in that sense, we stand on Jesus-shaped foundations. But actually, if we're, if we're brutally honest with ourselves as we look over the history of, of the West, and that's true in, in the US where I now live, it's true in, in the UK where I come from, we'll actually found, uh, find profound ways in which our history has been anti-Christian. And I think that's one of the things that folks today on all sides of sort of both 
political spectrums and even between Christians and non-Christians can find perplexing is that it's easy to, to tell a story in which once upon a time, you know, America was a Christian country that was following Jesus's ethics all across the board. And then the 60s came and the sexual revolution and the, the legalization of abortion, the gay rights movement, transgender rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that this is falling away from Christian ethics. And there are some senses in which that's true. But actually, if we look back to the period before the 60s, we find that the 60s and the civil rights movement was the first time that black Americans were getting any any kind of justice. Mm. And in fact, many things that were encoded into law prior to the 60s were profoundly anti-Christian. Um, folks, just to sort of, as a personal comment, folks sometimes ask me or say to me, you know, it must be really hard raising kids in today's culture when, you know, I'm living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the culture around me is in many ways specifically hostile to Christianity and in particular in terms of Christian sexual ethics. And I want to say, yeah, that's hard to raise children in, in that context. But actually, you know, take me back 50 years, take me back a, a hundred years. I'd be raising kids in a world where I had to say to them, because we're followers of Jesus, we need to cut across segregation lines. You know, because we're followers of Jesus, we cannot be treating our black brothers and sisters like that, like this, <laughs> that, that actually there are, there are, deeply anti-Christian, hostile to Christianity aspects of culture, you know, however far back you, you dial in terms of history. So I think that's where uh, that, that reality that I, I think we find in the Gospels, that we can't really come to Jesus smugly or in a self-satisfied way. We, we, always, we can only really come to him as repentant sinners. I think that sort of finds its feet historically as we look back at not just American history, but also history of my own country. Mm. Um, two, two cultures that are it seemingly infused with Christianity for centuries, in fact, absolutely failing to follow Christian ethics in, mm. in very important ways. And I think a lot of that is fed into today's misunderstandings of, of Jesus and misappropriations of Jesus, you know, both on the right and on the left. Yeah, and that that even is, comports well with a the theological understanding of humanity, that even as redeemed Christians, we are sinful. And that sin mm. is always going to be present and always going to be manifesting itself in anti-Christian ways. Uh, and yeah. that, your book is called Confronting Jesus, but it strikes me that it could have been called Confronted by Jesus, because that mm -hmm. seems to be so often what you're emphasizing is the ways that Jesus confronts us in many different ways in our culture today. I was surprised, though, to hear you say that you, you see this dynamic in the Gospels. I think we tend to think of Jesus as confronting the religious leaders, the establishment there in his time, but um, I would wonder if you could explain a little bit more where we see this dynamic of Jesus pushing back against preconceived ideas that various groups mm. would have had about him. Mm. Yeah, if we look even at Jesus' own disciples, uh, the, it's almost comic <laughs> in the Gospels how severely even his closest followers misunderstand him. So you know, famously, Jesus explains to his his disciples right after Peter has acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, God's long promised King, Jesus explains that he is in fact going to suffer and die. And Peter, again, who's just made this great um, declaration of, of who Jesus is, recognize his, his sort of divine kingship, takes Jesus aside and, and rebukes him, you know, tries to tell Jesus, no, 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 this, this cannot be the plan. This, you've got this wrong. And Jesus says those, those hard words to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Mm. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. So, so Peter, you know, one of Jesus' very, very closest followers, who goes on to be a, a key leader in the early church, fundamentally misunderstands what Jesus' mes messiahship means. And we see it again and again. We see James and John, two other of Jesus' closest um, chosen disciples, who come to Jesus um, in some accounts with it, you know, it's either their mother as, as the sort of foremost of the group or all, all the two boys, but they come as a little family group to say, hey, Jesus, in your new kingdom, can we be like your right and left hand guys? Because they really want to nail down their status in Jesus's new kingdom. And Jesus is like, you've got it completely wrong. You have no idea what you're asking for. And, and he has to explain to his disciples again and again that actually power in his kingdom like leadership in his kingdom is not about status and having power and privilege for yourself it's actually about service and sacrifice mm. in the gospels it's almost comic how much 
their vision of who Jesus is doesn't actually connect with who Jesus actually is and what his actual plan is. And I can laugh at them, but then I can see it in my own life Mm, and the ways in which I so quickly take Jesus as a sort of validation of me and my opinions. And and even as I'm I'm sort of trying to to teach what Jesus taught in different contexts, seeing my own sin rise up, um, the sort of sobering moment for me in writing the book when I just read again you know jesus's explanation to his disciples that he hadn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and that this is why power and privilege in his kingdom just works upside down and minutes after reading that not for the first time not for the second time not for you know for the however many the time i've read that teaching of christ i specifically like went to twitter to see if some someone with whom I have felt like slightly competitive has more or less followers than I do. I mean, like it's, and that's not even, that's not even a major area of sin. For, like if if you were going to do a highlights reel of my sin <laughs> areas of temptation, it's yeah. actually not at all about like how many Twitter followers you, it like actually makes very little difference to me at all. But even if I'm, I was just zooming in on this, what, what seems to me to be like one of my lesser sinful areas and, and, mere seconds after i've read jesus's teaching on this i can be in my heart actually Mm. disobeying it yeah yeah and and that that is sobering the capacity we have for hypocrisy even as we are trying to keep our eyes fixed on jesus trying to listen to what he says Mm. and so yeah it's unsurprising to me now that you know as i read the gospels it's unsurprising to see that in in jesus's disciples themselves and in jesus's disciples today I wonder if you could just take us take a step back and tell us a little bit more about yourself and how it is that you got into and got so focused on this area of apologetics. And you've written a number of books, a few of them for Crossway, where you focus on winsomely engaging with skeptics, uh, whether that's Confronting Christianity, this book that you wrote for Crossway a few years ago, another book kind of doing the same thing for teenagers, or this mm-hmm. new book. But why do you have such an interest in apologetics? It's funny, I feel like I have a slightly conflicted relationship with the word apologetics because apologetics has sometimes historically meant trying to prove non-believers wrong in a somewhat aggressive or point scorey sort of way. Mm. I mean, that's certainly not true of everyone who's who's sort of described themselves as an apologist in, in recent years, but there's been something of that vibe to where it's almost more important to prove your opponent wrong than to attempt to you know, truly win them for Christ. Mm. And Persuasion the, the, isn't really part of the goal. Yeah, and and even um, I love what Peter says about uh, you know, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have, but to do so with gentleness and respect. And I feel like often apologetics hasn't been marked by gentleness and respect, but by arrogance and <laughs> dismissiveness, you know, and, and finding the the worst form of your opponent's argument in order to to tear it down rather than um, rather than sitting alongside them and saying, hey, this is this is where I think your critiques are really valid. This is where I thoroughly agree with some of your some of your starting points. And this is why I think that actually Jesus provides a much more satisfying answer to the questions that you're you're wrestling with than than you might think but in terms of my my own history so that's sort of um you know side note on on apologetics (laughs) at at heart honestly i care about evangelism i have friends who feel much more called to discipleship than evangelism and that's great like i don't think everybody has to be cut exactly the same but in my heart what i most care about is people coming to know jesus and being ultimately saved and because for for many years of my life you know from kind of childhood onwards essentially i was in very academic not at all christian environments where most of my friends would not have been believers and would have had principled objections to christianity growing up in london and then going to to cambridge in the uk it uh, it was very different from my, my husband's experience growing up in oklahoma and then going to oklahoma state where as he would put it at least at that time even if his friends or, or you know, some, a new person he met didn't go to church themselves, they respected that he did. Yeah, yeah. You know, it made him seem like a kind of more impressive guy. That, or that like might they, even they be a positive some... thing in their mind. Yeah, exactly. Like, good for you. In the UK, 
acknowledging that you go to a, a Bible teaching church, not just a kind of church where the music's pretty and so you thought you might go for aesthetic or kind of cultural reasons. Huh. Acknowledging that you truly are a follower of Jesus, you might as well be saying you have two heads. <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> it is not going to win friends and influence people. In fact, it's probably going to produce, a, you know, at best perplexity and at worst uh, accusation. So not and not to say, I mean, there are so many countries and, and cultures today where it is far harder to be a Christian than it ever has been in the UK. So I, I, I don't say that to sort of position myself as some kind of martyr at all. But just to say that you know, much of my Christian formation happened mm. in a context where I knew that most people didn't follow Jesus, were not at all intrigued by Christianity, had long ago dismissed Christianity if they had ever once considered it. So, so when it comes to talking about Christianity with non-Christians, I think it's fair to say that we can sometimes be pretty nervous. We can be fearful, not just that we would ourselves start to question some of these tenets of our faith, but that we maybe even wouldn't have answers that would be satisfying to the unbeliever, that Mm -hmm. we would be offensive to them, that we would be viewed as strange or odd. And so I thought it could be helpful to talk through some of the common challenges or misconceptions that non-Christians tend to put forward related to Jesus and mm-hmm. hear how you'd respond, both for the person like that who's listening, but also for the Christian who's listening and wants to be in a better position to respond in mm-hmm. a winsome biblical way, as you said. So first misconception uh, is maybe the, the most basic fundamental one that we do hear sometimes. It's that Jesus never actually existed, that he's a fictional character that wasn't actually a real human being. What's the evidence for Jesus's existence? Yeah, I find one of the most helpful ways to answer questions ac- across a whole range of, of issues is to find respected experts who aren't actually in the same place as I am ideologically or, or belief-wise who will assert the, the truth or other, otherwise of a claim. So actually when somebody asks me, well, how do we know that Jesus really existed? what I'll likely first do is say, hey, there's a a very well-known New Testament scholar named Bart Ehrman who has um, written a number of books critiquing Christianity or critiquing um, Christian belief and certainly does not believe that Jesus is the son of God. And he says that it is absolutely, like essentially historically incontrovertible that Jesus in fact did exist Mm. and that we shouldn't even be asking that, that question anymore. What's more, he says that that the Gospels are clearly the best historical evidence we have about the life of Jesus. Now, they're not the only evidence, and that's one of the reasons why, from a a purely sort of historical perspective, the existence and the basic facts of Jesus' life are, are pretty much incontrovertible, is because we have early evidence from people who didn't even like Christians at all that Jesus was a first century rabbi who was claimed to be the Christ, the Messiah, God's, God's promised king. He was crucified under the Roman governor Pontius Pilate um, and who was subsequently worshipped by his followers as if he were a god. Mm. So you say those so, are the basic facts that are uh, pretty historically rock solid, even among secular scholars. Yeah, and that, so th- those are the facts. If we were, imagine we sort of set aside the Gospels completely. Those are the facts that we could know about Jesus of Nazareth. The reality is e- even those who don't think that Jesus in fact was raised from the dead or in fact performed miracles or in fact was the son of God, the idea that the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are not giving us any sort of valid historical evidence about Jesus would be very hard to defend mm, yeah. because they're, they're actually, <clears throat> they're written in historical terms very soon after the events that they describe um, and in Mark's gospel some would say earlier but even sort of skeptical scholars would say between sort of 35 and 45 years after jesus's death um well within the lifetimes of eyewitnesses of of jesus's life john the the latest gospel to be written down experts would generally agree likely about 60 years after jesus's death which if you think about the roman historians tacitus and suetonius they wrote their biographies of the emperor claudius about 60 years after his life and death without any of the kind of personal access to to claudius that the gospel Mm. authors had so in in historical terms the the gospels actually are very good evidence and and ring true in terms of their evident knowledge of the local geography and customs and even kind of religious debates of, of jesus's 
immediate context. Mm. I think today in our culture, you know, 60 years after someone lived, while it's not like unprecedented to get biographies or what have you that would come that late afterwards, we also see a lot of biographies or accounts of things that happen coming much sooner than that. We can kind of think, how could someone, how could we be confident in an account written six decades after the events? How could that be that reliable? I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So much mm-hmm. less, how are these people going to accurately recount these things? And how can we have confidence that they're not embellished in some way or tweaked in some way to fit a narrative? How, how mm-hmm. would you respond to that? Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is that the Gospels very clearly cite the eyewitnesses on whose testimony they're drawing. And whereas I don't remember what I had for breakfast a week ago and and likely nor do you, however old you and I are and however old anyone listening to this podcast is, there will be things that we remember from quite a long time ago because they had a profound impact on us. You know, I I remember circumstances and conversations even from from childhood and and that's not, uh, you know, none of the, well, certainly there were eyewitnesses of Jesus who were children, but in fact, the eyewitnesses we're, we're drawing on here are those among his male and female disciples who traveled with him primarily and some, you know, some non-itinerant disciples as well. But people whose full-time job was traveling around with Jesus and learning his sayings Mm -hmm. and watching what he did and who after his death and resurrection had made their business to go around telling everybody about all these stories about Jesus. You know, even in the case of John's gospel, as I say, the last to be written down likely by John in his 70s or 80s, recalling things that happened in his teens or 20s. It's like an actor who had learnt Shakespeare's plays in their early youth and then had been on tour, like Hamlet, for the for, for decades, <laughs> then being asked, you know, can you recite to be yeah. or not to be? Oh, yeah, funnily enough, I can. Yeah. It's not, I randomly remember a thing that happened ages ago. Mm. And it's also never dependent on just one witness. Because Jesus, you know, in addition to his 12 chosen apostles, he actually had a a large group of people who traveled with him, including many women, and, and Luke in particular highlights the the named women among Jesus's disciples on whose testimony the, the Gospels draw. And one of the striking things about the Gospels is that all of them point to the women's testimony in particular when it comes to Jesus's death and resurrection. And that that doesn't seem strange to us because we wouldn't think that a woman's testimony was less valid than a man's. But in first century cultural context, if you were making stuff up, you would never make it depend on a woman's testimony. Mm. You know, women, especially in religious matters, women were seen as prone to exaggeration and superstition. And it's, again, almost comic how in, in Luke's gospel, the women come back from the empty tomb, report to the apostles what they've seen and heard. And Luke comments that the disciples um, didn't believe the women. It seemed to them an idle tale, what they were saying. Mm. You know, sort of yeah, it one of the reports, one of actually yeah reports that stereotype actually happening uh, at that time. Yeah, and it, and and it's one example of many embarrassing episodes for the apostles, who went on to be the key leaders of the early church. Mm. So, folks who would say, you know, well, I mean, maybe there was some basis of truth in the gospels, but actually, clearly, they've been smoothed over and adapted for political reasons or you know a more authentic version of Jesus's life has been suppressed I'm thinking well you know if if there truly were censors um working through the gospels I and mean, it practically it would be it would have been extraordinarily hard to do but like let's imagine for a minute that there were if anybody had the power to um airbrush things out and add stuff in it would have been peter and even Mark's gospel, which as far as we can tell is is largely based on Peter's memories in particular, reports his abject failure. You know, the time when he said to Jesus, I'm willing to die with you. Jesus said, actually, you're going to deny me even tonight three times. Deny even knowing me. Peter says, no way. And that's exactly what happens. Mm, yeah. Now, if I were Peter, I would have made sure that story was never told. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't garner confidence in the movement uh, by showing its leaders to be incompetent and uh, faithless and yeah, hypocrites. Uh, so maybe that relates to then a second misconception that kind of relates to that issue of the reliability of the Gospels. And that's that Jesus was nothing more than a great moral teacher. And, and this one actually seems quite common in our culture today. More than people saying, I don't think he actually existed. We hear mm-hmm. things like, no, I respect Jesus. He was a great moral teacher, had a lot of really good ideas that we should follow today. We would all be better off if we adhered to his principles. But they would say that maybe all the the talk about Jesus being God and even the miracles and what have you, 
That was all just sort of his followers in the centuries following his death, embellishing again the story about him to make him fit some kind of narrative that was maybe more in service of the development of some kind of cult than it was actually Mm. recording history. So how would you Mm. respond to that idea that Jesus was really nothing more than a good moral teacher? It's impossible to square with any of the Gospels. Again, you know, if we look at Mark's Gospel versus John's and Mark written first, John, as far as we can tell, written last. And it's certainly true that in in John's Gospel, we see an an extraordinary number of situations where Jesus says things that only God would ever have the right to say. Perhaps my favourite is when he looks one of his female disciples, uh, Martha, in the eyes uh, after her brother has died and says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That is, those are not the words of a good teacher who is nothing more. Those are the words of a, either the son of God himself or a despicable narcissist. I am mm. the resurrection and the life. Yeah. Are you kidding me? So, so we see, you know, throughout John's gospel, for sure, Jesus making these stunning declarations, often playing on, on the covenant name of God from the Old Testament, which could be translated, I am who I am. But, but so let's set aside John's gospel for a minute and let's look at Mark and, and at Matthew and Luke, the sort of earlier gospels and, and Mark in particular. And in Mark's gospel is incontrovertible that Jesus is claiming to be so much more than just a good teacher. One example is, is when Jesus calms a storm just with his words and his disciples who are very afraid when the storm has sprung up and they think they're going to die are even more afraid afterwards Mm. and they say who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him or think of another story of of jesus being confronted with a paralyzed man who'd famously been lowered through the the roof of the house where jesus was was teaching and jesus looks at him and he says son your sins are forgiven And the religious leaders who are watching this are completely horrified because only God has the right to forgive sins. Who does Jesus think he is to be doing this? And Jesus uh, says, you know, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. And then he declares one of my favorite sort of dot, dot, dots of, of all time. He says, but that you may know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, get up and walk Mm. to the, the paralyzed man. He gets up and walks. And so time and again, you know, throughout even Mark's gospel, the first of the four, we see Jesus doing and saying things that only God has the right to, to say and do. And it's, it's very clear to the religious leaders who hate what Jesus is saying and doing that he is making the blasphemous claim that he is God. Mm. Now, of course, if he actually is God, it's not blasphemous. But there's no way really to read around those declarations and if you were to try and make a kind of non-supernatural version of Mark's gospel, which you know has certainly been attempted by, by some in history, you're, you're shredding on every page. Mm. In particular, you know, it comes to the, the resurrection claim about Jesus, which is the miracle on which the Christian faith stands or falls. You know, people will sometimes say, well, you know, Jesus was probably a, a great you know, charismatic teacher. And then as stories started to circulate about him, People got a little bit overexcited and ultimately they started claiming that he'd been raised from the dead. And you can see, I mean, that sort of makes a certain sort of sense if if you don't look into the details. But the problem with that hypothesis is that the very earliest documents we have about Jesus, which um, are actually not the Gospels, but some of Paul's first letters to the early churches, major on the resurrection. Because Christianity without the resurrection is like Romeo and Juliet without Juliet. It just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. If Jesus only died and was not raised from the dead, he is not, in fact, God's long promised king who has come to save the world and will ultimately return to judge the world. Mm. He's some guy who died 2,000 years yeah. ago and stayed dead. And that's, that's a point that Paul himself makes in his letters mm-hmm. that without the resurrection, all of this is just kind of a farce. So, one, uh, maybe one other objection or question that a non-Christian might wrestle with, even if they were to acknowledge that, yes, the Gospels do portray Jesus as a divine figure, that there is that baked into the cake, so to speak, they might still wrestle just with the logical possibility of the idea of a fully human, fully divine being. And they would just say, that fundamentally doesn't make sense to me. I don't see how those two things can exist together. That's obviously something that Christians also wrestle with and try to understand. But uh, what would you say to the non-Christian who just says, that core idea of your faith, that Jesus was both God and man, 
is fundamentally incoherent. If there is a God who made the universe, it would be absurd for us to think that we would be able to fully wrap our minds around him. Because as our, our secular friends will often remind us, we are tiny little mammals wandering around on a tiny little planet in an obscure solar system within a much, 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 much larger universe. You know, we, we are infinitesimally small compared to the God who, who made the universe. So if there is such a God, it shouldn't surprise us at all that we have a hard time wrapping our little mammalian minds <laughs> around some of the things that, that he does. Yeah. At the same time, if there is a God who made the universe, it is wild that he would become human mm. as Jesus yeah. did. Uh, it's completely shocking. And one of the things that's been more and more evident to me as I've thought about you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus's experience, is that we're sort of used, because even if we're not believers in Jesus ourselves, Christmas is sort of a, a you know, widely celebrated holiday. And we're, we're used to the idea that Christians claim that God was born as a human baby. Yeah. But from, from Mary's perspective, you know, here she is, a, a faithful Jewish first century woman living in, in a world where the Jews were being ruled over by the Romans who were pagans and believed in many, many gods. Uh, the Jews had the very unpopular view <laughs> that there was in fact only one God who had made the heavens and the earth and that any other sort of so-called gods were, were just idols. So, so one of the Jewish distinctives was belief in one universal creator God. The idea from a Jewish perspective that this one great universal, utterly transcendent creator God, who humans couldn't even look on and live, would have taken on humanity. The idea that, that the God of all the universe would, as the Bible puts it, become flesh in the person of, of Jesus and, and be conceived in Mary's womb is absolutely wild. But then any time we start to ponder on the universe, we find ourselves pondering extraordinarily wild things. You know, any, anyone who has the, the least understanding of, of modern science will, will have to acknowledge at times, do you know what? Crazy stuff has gone down. <laughs> um, things that, that sounds uh, utterly extraordinary. So the fact that what Christians call the incarnation, the taking on of, of humanity, of the, the Son of God, uh, the fact that that seems incomprehensible to us shouldn't lead us to say well it couldn't possibly be true it should lead us to wonder if there is a god and if th this is true what on earth does that mean for us and i think it means some extraordinary things mm. yeah it can be so easy to embrace a kind of uh, as c.s lewis said chronological snobbery in how we think about these things and we kind of assume that maybe the jesus's first followers those early Christians were just obviously scientifically illiterate and gullible. And so the idea of God becoming a human was easier to accept for them. But it's so helpful when you emphasize that, especially in that Jewish context, that the idea of God taking on humanity uh, to himself was just as groundbreaking and uh, kind of out of this world, so to speak, than it is for us today. You emphasize a lot in your first book with Crossway Confronting Christianity, and also in this book, just the, the global nature of Christianity, that this is a message, this is a, a good news that is for the world. And it, as you said, you think at the very beginning of our conversation, Christianity is the most diverse religious system, religious worldview of, of all of them, in your opinion, and the opinion of many others. How does that square with that distinctly Jewish identity that that not only the Old Testament certainly has, but then even Jesus and, and all of the New Testament. From the very first, when God called Abraham, he made promises to Abraham that would impact not only Abraham's family, but actually all the peoples of the earth. Uh, you know, he said that all families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And when Jesus comes as the savior and Messiah of the Jews, he comes also as the savior of the world. We see that articulated at one point very beautifully um, after Jesus had a long conversation, in fact, his longest private conversation that he has with anybody in the gospels with a Samaritan woman at a well. And because we, we're not first century Jews, it's hard for us to recognize quite how weird it was that Jesus was talking to a Samaritan at all, let alone a Samaritan woman, let alone a Samaritan woman who'd had five husbands and was now living with someone who wasn't her husband because the Samaritans were the folks who the Jews were raised to hate. So, so Jesus is crossing um, racial and religious boundaries in talking with this woman. And when she goes back and tells all her Samaritan friends about him and they come to, to hear from him as well, 
they say, you know, now we see and we have come to see that Jesus is the savior of the world. And that is the, the promise of Christianity from the first, that this particular first century Jewish man who carried with him the promises of God over centuries, the creator God who made the world, was the one through whom people from every tribe and tongue and nation across the world would be saved. So the, the extraordinary multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic reality of the global church today, and it's not just my opinion, it's just like the demographic reality that Christianity is by far not only the the largest but the most diverse belief system in the world today. The seeds of that were planted thousands of years ago and we see in the New Testament an explicitly cross-cultural Christian movement. Again, we often we often miss its significance because our cultural barriers and our racial and religious barriers aren't the same as those in the first century. So when Paul says that here there is no Jew nor, nor Greek, aka Gentile, no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, you know, I don't, I don't know any barbarians or Scythians, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, but in his terms, he was explaining how faith in Jesus breaks down all cultural barriers and, and animosities as we are, we are drawn into the one body of Jesus, which is the church today. Mm. So there's, there's a delightful continuity between God's messaging in the Old Testament as he chooses Israel to be a light to the nations, um, Jesus stepping on into human history as the light of the world and how that light has gone out from its first century Jewish Middle Eastern roots all across the world today, hmm. even to America. Hmm. That's a perfect segue into maybe our final misconception that we could talk about today. And it relates to that relationship that Jesus had and has with the Old Testament. I think sometimes in our culture, Jesus is portrayed as, in some sense, kind of a overturning or a, a contrast to the Old Testament conception of God as an angry, vindictive, capricious deity that loves to judge people and kill people. And and Jesus comes then onto the scene preaching a new message, a message of love and peace and acceptance, uh, of caring for the downtrodden, uh, of justice even. Uh, and that's viewed as a contrast to what we see in the Old my guess is that many Christians maybe know that that's not right, but they might have still wondered this. They might have sensed that there is a distinction maybe in Scripture. Have you ever observed that, and how would you respond to that kind of question? Yeah, I think it's a it's a common misconception, and I think the best antidote to it is reading the Old Testament and reading the New Testament. <laughs> and I think we'll see we'll see that misconception sort of uh, crumbling. So you think it's that simple? You know, you kind of said that tongue in cheek, but is it is it really? mostly an issue if we don't know our Bibles well enough? Yes. Um, well, yes and. So number one, and again, as I mentioned, we're reading through Matthew's Gospel uh, as, as a Bible study group. And there we see both incredible words of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness from Jesus and a, and a sort of um, expansive, all, all sinners welcome approach that he takes and terrifying words of judgment, mm. which we gloss over at our peril and we see in in the old testament extraordinary love and compassion from the lord to his people extraordinary love and compassion for those who are outside and beyond his people and we see terrifying acts of of judgment for those who who rebel against god um, now it is absolutely true that in in jesus god was fulfilling promises over centuries and that there is meaningful change, I guess would be you know, what, one way to, to put it between how we relate to God now and how God's people in, in the Old Testament related to God. Last night with our community group, we were reading a confrontation that Jesus has with the, the Pharisees, where one of the things he says is something greater than the temple is here, mm. talking about himself yeah. and saying that the, the building, which had been the central focal point of, of Jewish worship, and where God was most distinctly seen to dwell. That building where the sacrifices were made and where prayers were offered and where um, you know faithful Jews would, would pilgrimage to that, that particular place, that he in fact is greater. And if we, if we read the Old and New Testament together, we'll see that the temple is pointing us toward Jesus, who was the, the, the true temple in whom the real sacrifice was made. So there are uh, many profound ways in which Jesus is fulfilling what the Old Testament pointed us toward. So it's absolutely, it's not true that 
you know, we relate to God now just as we did relate to God prior to, to Jesus's life, death and, and glorious resurrection. But there is a continuity of message as forgiveness is is offered for those who will come repentantly to the Lord. Mm. And what we discover in the New Testament is that Jesus's death and resurrection is the means of that forgiveness. Mm. It's not that it's not that God was never calling people to repent and believe and be forgiven prior to that. He absolutely was. But we see in Jesus how that forgiveness was going to be achieved through the one who is, as Matthew's gospel puts it, God with us. Mm. Mm. So beautiful. Such a wonderful thing for us to be emphasizing as we think about this and talk about with this with our friends and neighbors. Uh, maybe as a final question for you, Rebecca, what would you say to the person listening, to the non-Christian listening to this? Maybe someone sent this to them. Maybe they've just been doing their own investigation, trying to understand who Jesus really is and what that means for them. What encouragement would you give to the person who is is wondering and isn't sure what they think yet, isn't hasn't bought into some of the things that you're saying here, but nevertheless is curious and wants to know more. I wrote a book for you. <laughs> I mean, very, very specifically, I wrote Confronting Jesus for the person who isn't sure what they think. It maybe um, has has read other, other resources that have helped them to question some of their objections to, to Christianity in the first place maybe is curious about Jesus but doesn't feel ready yet to just pick up one of the Gospels and and read it for themselves. I would encourage somebody in that position, honestly ideally to just pick up one of the Gospels and and read for themselves, there's no ultimate substitute for that but if you feel like you need something to kind of bridge you into that that space or to answer some some questions um, maybe before you get there then that's the the reason why I wrote this book in particular to take seriously some of the the doubts and questions and and challenges that you know folks might legitimately have and to look at the gospel accounts of Jesus life in light of those and see what we find. Well Rebecca thanks again for talking with us today and helping us to think through some of these common ways that people think about Jesus, ways that people misunderstand Jesus, and help us be prepared to to discuss them with our friends. You're so welcome. That was Rebecca McLaughlin on Common Misconceptions About Jesus. For more, be sure to check out her book with Crossway, Confronting Jesus, Nine Encounters with the Hero of the Gospels. Pick up your copy of the print book for 30% off, or a copy of the ebook or audiobook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org slash plus. That's crossway.org slash plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a review. That really helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.